Hi, everybody. Welcome back to the Run to the Top podcast. Uh, today on our show, we have our guest, Sage Canada. Uh, Sage is on our uh, show today to talk about trail running and ultra running. running and um, he has quite the experience, not only in that, but as a, a traditional runner and marathoner as well. Just to give you a little bit of a background, uh, Sage uh, is a 216 marathoner, and he've qual he's qualified for the last two Olympic trials. And I believe in the, the first time he qualified in New York City, he was the youngest uh, qualifier in that uh, Olympic trials for the marathon. Since then, he's decided to move to ultra running and trail running. And uh, so far, he's had tremendous success. He's the American record holder at the Mount Washington Hill Climb. And he's also the 2012 USA Mountain Running Champion. So if, uh, as we talk today, if you, have, if you want to visit the resources that we mentioned on this podcast or you want to know more about Sage, you can visit runnersconnect.net slash rc12 and that'll give you all the details on this podcast and one more thing if you like this podcast please visit itunes and give us a, a rating and, and vote for us and tell us that you like us it'll help other people find the podcast and um with all, with all that let's get started and um welcome sage hi sage welcome to the show oh thanks for having me awesome well you know we really appreciate you coming here today and and talk, sharing your experience with uh, ultra running and trail running and also you know, the experience that you have with transitioning from kind of the more traditional runner. Um, you know, I did a brief introduction with some of your major accomplishments, but, you know, let's give our audience a little bit more in-depth picture of who you are and, and how you've kind of evolved through the sport from, you know, training probably in high school and then through uh, now doing a lot of ultra running and trail running. Uh, yeah, basically, and I started uh, running pretty seriously. Actually, in middle school, I was doing track and uh and by the time I was doing high school, I was doing cross country in the fall. And I really always enjoyed running on the trails. I grew up in Oregon, so there's a lot of opportunities to run out in the woods, uh, run up and down hills. And that's good training for cross country. But I also did the traditional track route. And I went to Cornell University, where I, I ran for Coach Robert Johnson. Uh, and I always was probably more competitive at cross country. It seemed like we were running 8K cross-country races, and I was beating guys that would crush me at 10K, even on the track. Uh, so I always liked the hills, and I always liked the challenge of, of being on uneven terrain, I guess. Uh, but so I, It was I, a calling I, from the beginning. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, I don't know. I just, you know, the, I like running fast, too, but, it, you know, the, the hills are always, I think I'm better at running uphill uh, than <laughs> flat or downhill for sure. So I uh, slowly built my mileage up over those years I was training year round and I, I that's when I first got over 100 miles a week uh, which is pretty high volume even for division one college mm -hmm. and we did more marathon type training because I convinced my coach to run the marathon that year uh, when I was 20 21 years old when I qualified for the first trials and then so, so just to make sure our audience knows you you qualified for the Olympic trials in the marathon in uh, 2008 when you were in, still in college yeah, it was actually 2007, yeah. Oh, so yeah, I, well, right, right. I ran my first marathon at Houston over winter break that year, and I missed the standard by 21 seconds, and so I was devastated at first, but then I decided I'd run Grandma's Marathon in June right after track season, and it was really hot that year, but I, I was able to hold on and qualify with 17 seconds to spare, so that was barely making it. <laughs> nice. Um, um, but let me interrupt there for a second. How did... Um, when you're, how did your training look that spring when you were, uh, I'm assuming, trying to do a, an NCAA track season, which you know involves a lot of speed work, 10K is the longest distance, and then how did you go and run a marathon in June? What did that, what did that training look like? Um, I mean, basically, Robert Johnson at Cornell, his training was more based on marathon-type uh, training, even for the 5K and 10K on the track, so I had that kind of going for me. Uh, we still did a lot of track workouts, traditional VO2 max workouts, uh, even like, you know, 200s and 400s for leg turnover. But I always kept my mileage pretty high. And I was doing some, you know, two-hour long runs probably, but nothing extremely long for marathon specific. But basically, I ran the 10K at conference. I had five weeks till the marathon. And in those first couple of weeks, I just ramped my mileage up to like 120. <laughs> I started doing 20-mile long runs, 22-mile long runs pretty hard. Um, I did some back-to-back -back workouts that would get my legs calloused for the, the extra distance to go 26.2. So 
That was the main thing. I had to change right away. <laughs> yeah. No, that's, I mean, that's actually probably a pretty good time period, that five-week period where you can do some marathon-specific work. So it makes sense. Yeah. I was just curious if there was anything, you know, really interesting that you did because I'm sure there's some people that come off, uh, you know, either doing shorter type races and, and then want to move to the marathon. So glad that, glad it's, you know, they can see that it's possible and, and obviously to be successful even on a, on a tough day. Yeah. I mean, generally, like, it seemed like when I moved up in race distance, I got better. Mm -hmm. So... Um, I was just kind of, I knew I had the speed to run the marathon qualifying time. I just needed to get that specific endurance in. And, you know, some people do it the other way. They'll build the endurance first, mm -hmm. then add a little bit of speed. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I, I think uh, you could do both ways, and it, it'll work out in the end if you get that mix of training stimulus in there. So Right. So so after college, what did you, uh, you know, where did your running career take you? Uh, I was fortunate enough to be accepted into the Hanson's Brooks uh, Distance Running Project, which I'm sure you're familiar with. <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> uh, there's a lot of really cool guys to run with, actually. Brian So was still on the team uh, when I joined, so I got to kind of pick his brain. Um, Clint Barron was still out there. And a lot of more you know, mature guys that had actually run under 215 in the marathon. So um, that was a different training stimulus for me, too, because – the overall intensity was a lot higher, mm -hmm. and the mileage was consistently higher. Um, and just having so many fast guys like push you every day uh, was a lot different. But it, I think it helped me eventually uh, become a stronger runner as I matured. But it definitely took a couple years to kind of kick in. Yeah, it's definitely there's definitely a, a, um, a long process there sometimes in terms of where you get adapted and you're not just t dog tired every day and racing tired it's uh it's tough but once it, once you adapt it definitely obviously helps and so you ran uh 216 while a member of the hansons um team i did yeah it was uh my second year there 2011 uh at the rock and roll san diego marathon i ran uh it's 216 52 so it's 216 uh, in my book <laughs> yeah uh, closer to 217 but uh, i also ran a, a 104 32 in the half marathon before that which Honestly, it was probably my best performance while I was there. Mm -hmm. um, and I also ran the Olympic trials uh, in 2012 for them. And that was right before, that was my last race as a Hanson's Brooks athlete. Okay. Um, so, you know, kind of moving into into the next phase, you know, you were, and, and I, I kind of know from your background that that's when you started doing more of kind of the trail racing and, and ultra running. You know, because you were having, you obviously were having a lot of success in the shorter distance, well, quote unquote shorter distances, um, you know, the, the half marathon and marathon, you know, what made you kind of make the jump to doing some trail running and, and ultra running? Um, I mean, it was always in the back of my mind after, you know, having fun in cross country in college. Um, I, I still want to go back to the roads mm -hmm. and, you know, try to qualify for the trials again in 2016. Uh, so it's not like I'm saying no more to the roads at all. Right, right. Maybe even try to go back and get a 10K PR on the track. I don't know. <laughs> but, I, I think the mix is good, and just in training, it's good to have a variety to change things up every couple years. Um, it's a great break mentally. It's a totally different mindset uh, when you're running out on some of the trails. Uh, the course is an extra challenge, just, you know, surviving the course, surviving the extra long distance mm -hmm. uh, beyond 26.2, I think uh, will really help me be a stronger runner overall. Um, so I guess the, the challenge drew me in, and I just want to see – you know how I stacked up and what it felt like. Yeah, well, I mean, it's obviously you've had success in it, so it was, it was definitely a good decision. You know, obviously in terms of even competitively, you know, you're definitely competitive in that space. Um, so, but how did when you first transitioned? You know, how did the training change from you know what you were doing in the marathon to you know what you were doing to prepare for first, some of your first ultras and trail races? Um, a less less of a focus on speed work. I actually, I haven't touched the track all year. Um, <laughs> I've done some hard, some pretty hard, like, VO2 max efforts, mm -hmm. but it involves more, like, trying to run as fast as I can up a mountain. Uh, if anyone in the Boulder area knows of Green Mountain, I've been uh, basically racing up that uh, as some of my harder workouts. So I'll run, you know, 20 or 30 minutes straight uphill uh, at, a, you know, 85% maximum heart rate to 100% basically at the end, mm -hmm. and that's what I consider speed work now. Um, I also have extended my long runs a little bit. When I was at Hanson's, we were limited to just going 20 miles for our long run, mm -hmm. and I always felt like I kind of wanted to go farther, because um, I have before in college, I did some longer runs, 
and I like the idea of building extra strength by doing like over distance mm -hmm. type of training. So I extended my long run up to 28 miles. I got in a, a good 28 miler before my first 50k trail run, and that was back in March okay. at the Shuckanut. Um, and less emphasis on on you know high intensity paces. So like you're out on the trail running the long run. It's very specific to trail running. You don't really have to worry about what pace you're running. You have to go more by effort and kind of just counting more time on your feet rather than hitting certain mile splits because the course changes so much and there's so many hills you get discouraged if uh, you're always looking at your GPS. Yeah, so that makes sense. So even in the training, that's you're you're, predominant, you're probably doing more mileage overall um, and a lot of it's a lot easier, I'm assuming. There's probably maybe one key workout or two key workouts a week. Yeah, I'd actually even say the mileage isn't higher it just takes longer to get in because um, <laughs> uh you know i'll run 90 miles a week still maybe but it takes just as long as when i was running 110 or 115 miles a week on the road just because you're running maybe a minute a mile slower out on the trails but as long as you're putting in the time uh you're still training your aerobic system for you know 90 minutes or two hours and i think there's a lot of value in that so you don't get too caught up in the numbers kind right. of more relaxing, actually, I think. <laughs> yeah. So, um, I mean, that's what I've kind of imagined. Um, so uh, pretty much all the running that you do is, is on the trail. Is that f because you, I mean, it might be both, but is it because you enjoy it more, or is it because that you're trying to be as specific as possible to the race that you're trying to train for? Uh, definitely both. I'm really fortunate now that I live in Boulder, so there's a whole network of trails. Uh, it wasn't quite the same in Michigan, mm -hmm. but also the the fact that a lot of trails are, it's just softer on your joints. So, um, you know, if you're running 100% of your miles on the road, it's it could really beat you up and you want to kind of change out of your routine, I guess. Uh, so I'll mix it up still. I'll, I'll go to the roads if I want to do a, some sort of tempo run, but it's kind of rare these days for me to do that. Mm -hmm. um, and there's so many different trails. I mean, you're like, it's usually a, I'm making up my mind whether or not I want to go up a really big hill or mountain or stay on relatively flat trails and mm -hmm. uh, see what I could do. But, yeah, I, I think it's it's better to train specifically for the type of race you're doing. So if you're doing a trail ultra, you got to spend some time on the trails. Mm -hmm. um, so what about, how do you um, handle the hills in the training? Like you said, there's sometimes you choose routes based on, you know, how hilly or, or flat they are. Um, but obviously you're going up and down a lot. You know, how does that factor into, you, you know, not only the intensity and recovery, um, but, you know, in terms of the overall planning, like how often do you try to incorporate, specifically incorporate hills into your training? Uh, pretty often. It, it does depend on the race that I'm focusing on. So, like, a lot of ultra races, I'll study the elevation map, and I'll say, okay, this is a 50-mile race. There's 10,000 feet of vertical. Like, that's a decent amount of up and down. So, in that case, I'm going to be putting in, more hilly long runs. I'll do probably a, a, at least a 20 miler every weekend um, that has quite a bit of hills in it. Maybe not 5,000 feet of vertical. That's really hard to get in, but uh, <laughs> at least some some several thousand feet probably of change. And I'll map it out um, on like Google Earth or something. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I'd, I'd probably try to get that in at least once a week. And just around Boulder, I mean, it's so hilly, it's hard not to. <laughs> Right. Up and down hills, but I think you know hills are speed training in disguise, basically. And even going down hills, it 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 works your quads in a different way. So mm -hmm. I think um, doing hills more frequently is actually beneficial to a lot of runners, even people running on the road. Yeah. So how do you handle the downhills? I'm, you know, because I can imagine, like the way I picture it, um, and again, I don't have a ton of experience with trail running, but you know, I just picture it being a. a, a a scary free fall, you know, when you're kind of going down, especially on a trail where it's, you know, the footing might not be great, you know, kind of how do, how do you handle it physically? You know, are there any tricks that you use or, and, and also mentally, you know, how do you kind of get over the fact that you might fall on your ass? Yeah, <laughs> oh, definitely. I mean, it depends how technical the trail is because uh, some trails will be like really rocky, like running down Pikes Peak, for example. Mm -hmm. A lot of people will fall on that because you trip on a rock when you're getting tired. Mm -hmm. um, I generally don't like the downhills. Okay. <laughs> I'm more of an uphill runner, but uh, you definitely have to let loose. Uh, you have to take some risks. A lot of it comes down to how much of a risk you're willing to take, mm -hmm. uh, how much blood you want to leave out on the course. Um, and sometimes, depending on what stage, at what point you are in the race, 
you don't necessarily want to fly on the downhills because that might come back later and and uh, bite you. Like a lot of people who run the Boston Marathon, for example, know that you don't go as fast as you can on the first 10k downhill because uh, it'll it'll beat up your quads. So mm -hmm. it's not always about speed on the downhills. It's about being consistent and steady, not falling. Uh, in my first ultra, I ended up getting five stitches wow. from falling. So uh, it's definitely a a risky thing that keeps you on your toes. Yeah. So you, you feel like you've improved over time? Because I guess I see it the way you just described it as probably like uh, the Tour de France guys. When, you know, I watch them on TV, I'm like, those guys are nuts. You know, they're flying. When they go down the hills, they're just flying and taking those corners. But, you know, they've obviously had years of experience. And do you feel like at, at this point you've kind of developed that experience over time and with patience? Uh, definitely a little bit. I'm, I'm, still, I'm still learning a lot, especially about technical trails and downhill. Uh, but it's definitely a, a skill that I think that with the more experience you have, the better you get at it. Um, there is some natural ability involved. Like I think I'm naturally better at going uphill mm -hmm. rather than downhill, and it's right. kind of a trade-off. But uh, it's definitely something that if you work on it, you could improve a lot, uh, both ups and downs and the technical trail aspect. And having proper footwear also helps, mm -hmm. I've found, too. Yeah, you know what, let's actually get into that. So um, we had some user questions, and for, for those listening, you know, we post on our social media, on our Facebook and Twitter. Um, you can follow us. We post when we have uh, guests, and so we had actually some guests uh, or some uh, of our audience members uh, post some questions, and a lot of them were actually focused around shoes and, and what you're trying to choose to wear. So let's talk about that a little bit. Um, you know, how do you, when you're approaching a race, how do you um, – decide what shoe to wear and um, actually we can probably tell your story of, of what happened recently because I think it's a uh, with your at your last race because I think it's a good lesson for that you've learned and that you can probably teach to our audience yeah I definitely recommend uh, trail shoes are usually quite a bit different from road shoes but I'll have I'll take a couple of different shoes to a race and depending on whether or not I've seen the course ahead of time I'll make a decision there and it's shoe selection is really important so I was in San Francisco at the North Face 50 this weekend, and it was there was a big storm coming in. It was raining at least like an inch an hour at times, um, and we were running on these fire roads that I thought drained pretty well, um, but I found out in the second half of the race that uh, <laughs> everyone's footprints had made it pretty muddy. Uh, it got flooded. It was like a slip and slide going up and down the hills, and unfortunately, I chose to wear my lightweight road racing flats. Um, I'm fortunate enough to be sponsored by Scott Sports, and I was wearing this pretty lightweight, it's 6.5 ounce road racing flat, basically. It's, it's great on the roads, it'd be great for a marathon. It was great for the first 20 miles of the race, but once I hit those muddy hills, I was slipping all over the place. Mm -hmm. And it's really unfortunate, because actually, uh, they, Scott had just sent me this new trail shoe, um, the TC2, and it has pretty good lugs on the bottom, like okay. really good traction. And I had these with me, and they're all muddy because I was wearing them around at the start. <laughs> I, it was my mistake. It was kind of a you know a bad error on my part mm -hmm. to choose to not go with this shoe, and instead go with my road racing flat. And it was I think it cost me a lot of energy out on the course, and I definitely fell a lot and was bleeding a lot. So uh, shoe shoe is. You know, your choice of shoes is critical, mm -hmm. um, and it's good to give yourself options. Try to study the course. Um, ideally, you'd know kind of what the most technical parts of the course are because that's a huge factor in ultra races is, you know, what if there's rocks or if there's mud or if it's if you have water crossings maybe or, mm -hmm. you know, what the hills are like. And sometimes it's hard to gauge. Yeah, so I, I guess I have two follow-up questions. Um, I guess the first would, would would you say it's fair to say that the lesson that you learned is – maybe be more uh, air on the side of, of wearing a trail shoe as opposed to a, um, a more traditional r running shoe? Would you say that might be the lesson you learned, or, or maybe not? Maybe I'm off. Uh, definitely. Air on the side of uh, sacrificing a little bit of weight, maybe, for extra traction. Mm -hmm. uh, that was the main thing. I, you know, I was, lighter's not always better, because if you're losing traction, you've already <laughs> kind of, that energy cost has already come back uh, to get you. So, yeah, it's always better to have something that has better traction than something that doesn't. And usually the shoes with better traction do weigh a little bit more. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's something you got to experiment around with, and I didn't 
put in the time <laughs> before yeah. the race is kind of a last minute thing. So you definitely want to do your research on that. Okay. I mean, that makes, I mean, I, I don't have quite as much experience, but I'm, I'm, I'm relating it to cross country when you choose your spike size, you know, before the race, when you say like, Oh, am I going to go with a short spike or a long spike? And you know, sometimes you make a mistake and pick a short one and the course is really muddy and it doesn't work out, but it's not 50 miles. So it's over a little before, <laughs> yeah. before it really gets bad. Everything gets magnified. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and I guess actually the second question is, I was curious about this and, and somebody asked about this is, do you ever have an uh, option where you'll carry another extra pair of shoes with you? Um, so, for example, at this race, uh, you know, the first 20 miles were are, were relatively easy or, or better terrain, and then switching to a, a, a more traditional trail shoe. Have you ever tried that or, or know people that have? Oh, definitely. Yeah, that's actually a great strategy. Um, in a lot of ultras, they call them you having a drop bag. So at some of the aid stations in, in the middle of the race, you could have a bag set aside with your number or your name on it and they'll you'll throw in an extra jacket you'll throw in an extra pair of shoes and so a lot of people stop at aid stations and they'll be able to switch shoes uh, which is honestly what I, I should have done I actually had some help uh, when my parents were there watching they could have uh, I could have changed but I, I didn't think about it at the time I was really trying to open up a gap on the field and every minute was critical so I I didn't stop and do that but when I look back on it now, I definitely should have, and I definitely should have gotten my jacket out too because I started getting really cold. Okay. Um, but yeah, if you do an ultra and you get a drop bag, I definitely take advantage of it. Put extra clothes, extra shoes, even extra food, uh, gels in it too because it, it can make a huge difference later on. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, so um, so in that sense, it, it sounds like you know with, with the trail running and ultra running that you're doing, it sounds like the preparation and, and kind of getting all the details right is, is definitely a lot more important and something you have to put a lot more time into than um, than a normal race. Are there any um, lessons or I guess strategies that you've picked up over the last couple of months of things that you uh, that can help you like the drop bag, those types of things? Oh yeah, definitely. Um, you got to study like the race will come out with a list of what they provide at the aid stations. Mm -hmm. uh, so for example, at this race they weren't handing out any gels which is rare because usually they hand out gels at aid stations. So I knew that I had to stuff a bunch more in my pockets, basically. Um, but they also had other things like candy bars and potato chips and peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. Uh, so you got to kind of figure out what you know, you're going to eat out there on the course, what works well for you. And you could do that in training on your long runs ahead of time, figure out whether you not like to eat potato chips during a run or you want to take salt tablets instead mm -hmm. um, and also studying the, the top of the elevation map of a course I think is really critical because that will determine how I do my long runs, how I do my hill training because uh, if it's got a lot of up and down then you have to be ready for that or your legs are going to protest a lot when you get <laughs> out there. So yeah. just studying the course map too I'd say like a lot of these trail runs uh, I've had the misfortune of getting lost uh, which isn't good so it's good to, to study the map, too, and see where the major turns are, kind of mm -hmm. figure out uh, where you're going in the race. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, I have a question, and for those who don't know, uh, Sage was talking about the race that he ran last weekend, and um, you happened to go off course at, at, at one point. Did, did, you, uh, added, did you feel like you adequately looked at the trail map before the race, or were you kind of, did you feel like that was a mistake that you made? Um, well, in this case, it was, uh, it was kind of a special circumstance because... Because of the weather, they actually changed the course the day before the race. I see. So I, I've been studying this trail map for weeks and weeks and weeks. <laughs> uh, because of all the flooding, uh, they had to totally redo the course. And so they came out with a map the day before, uh, which I did study. But this race also started in the dark. Uh, it started at 5 a.m. And the part where we got lost was about an hour and a half in, and it was still basically pitch black out. Mm -hmm. Um, and I was in the lead with two other guys. Um, actually, no, I was in second place <laughs> with two other guys. And, uh, you know, honestly, we didn't even see the, there was a fork in the trail, but we didn't even look off to see uh, the fork. It mm -hmm. was just, it was a part where the course overlaps and it was kind of confusing. Um, and it, it, when you're in the dark, it's, it's really hard. Yeah, I can imagine. So that, that was kind of a special case, I think. Usually it's not like that. Usually it's not raining really hard and dark and you know if you're in the lead it's it's sometimes harder to route find 
because mm-hmm. uh, I think they're supposed to be a volunteer at that intersection, and they hadn't gotten there yet. So okay. that was kind of part of the problem. Um, but yeah, you definitely want to study the map ahead of time and hope they don't change it last minute. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, I guess that's probably part of the uh, extra challenge that goes along with these types of races is, you know, those types of things can happen. You know, they're, they're not going to change a marathon course, you know, too much at least. And, um, you know, you never know, I guess, what could happen. But um, let's actually move on to something that you talked about just previously with, you know, kind of the fueling and those that type of thing. Um, you know, obviously you're running for a significantly longer time than you would for even a marathon. You know, how does how does your approach to fueling change um, at that point when you're going to be out there for, t- you know, probably twice as long as a marathon, maybe longer than that? It changes a lot. Uh, you have to eat a lot more. Uh, one of my friends say, uh, you know, a 50-mile ultra is like a, it's like an eating contest, 50 <laughs> miles, because uh, you basically you want to take in quite a bit of carbs and you also want to take in some electrolytes, uh, some sodium uh, to help kind of ward off the cramps. So depending on the weather, depending on how much you're sweating, uh, that could also change a lot. But general rule of thumb, you're going to start needing probably about two, maybe 300 calories an hour out there, which is a lot. That is a lot. Yeah, I'll be taking three gels an hour, sometimes more. Um, and then sometimes I'll switch from drinking Gatorade to just drinking straight Coke at the aid stations. And it's it just it's really critical in ultras because if you bonk, it's going to get really bad. <laughs> right. If have, and if you have 10 or 20 miles to go and you're bonking, then it's hard to pull out of that. And so you try to keep your blood sugar as level as possible. And uh, if you didn't take anything, you, you would be it would be like running a marathon and you'd be hitting the wall you know, between 20 and 25 miles, uh, and just the energy cost of going up hills, too, you have to take into account, too, so mm-hmm. um, a lot of people take a lot of gels. Some people eat solid bars. Um, yeah, so what's your, you, so you still do the gels. I would, I would feel personally that taking three gels an hour, like, I would start getting pretty sick of them after just an hour, and I'd have three or four more hours to go, um, but the gels kind of work for you, or? Yeah, uh, well, they have, um, for the most part, I'll change it up, and it really depends on the race, because sometimes they'll have aid stations every four miles, sometimes it's every eight miles, uh, and so you could load up on gels at each station, you stop there, and you could take some, and when I start getting sick of the sugar, because it is pretty sweet, I'll, uh, sometimes I'll grab a handful of potato chips, uh, which I did in a couple races that worked out well for me, and I think Having that sodium in there also helps, um, and you get some sodium from the Coke and the Gatorade, but uh, the chips tasted good. I think the fat <laughs> tasted good, um, but I, I definitely know people that have taken, and like Max King, for example, he took a couple hammer bars uh, during a 100K race that we did, mm-hmm. and he's, that seemed to really help him, but it's a fine balance because sometimes your stomach doesn't feel real good, but you know you have to keep eating or you're going to bonk. Right. Uh, so it's it's something you want to you know practice in your long runs and training. Um, a lot of people, most people carry either a handheld bottle or like a Camelback type of hydration system with them. Mm-hmm. So I'll carry a 20 ounce handheld in my hand and it'll be full of Coke and I'll be sipping on that between aid stations and then I'll fill it up because uh, you always want to get that constant flow of energy uh, and it's a lot more critical than. A road marathon just because you're out there for so long right what about um you know you kind of mentioned it briefly with the potato chips what about taking uh like protein and, and maybe even a little bit of fat like have you ever have you experimented or know people that have used protein and and included that and how has that worked um uh definitely i think for the longer ultras especially like 100k to 100 miles it becomes even more critical to eat all sorts of things things that have a lot of protein and fat in them mm-hmm uh, generally, I've, I've kind of stayed away from a whole lot of protein. I know some of the, the gels, I think the Roctane, have some amino acids in them. Right. Um, and I've taken a lot of those. So I think that definitely helps a little bit. Uh, it kind of depends how long you're going to be out there. Um, and like I said, the potato chips, uh, I'm not sure if it's the salt or the fat that tasted good, but you definitely are burning a lot of fat too. And right. so to, to utilize fat as a fuel uh, is going to make it more efficient for your glycogen stores too so um, probably taking in some fat uh, is good too eventually depending on uh, for the longer the race I'd say yeah 
Um, and, and I know probably the question is the question, answer to this question is going to be something along the lines of you know you enjoy doing it, but you know one of the things that I've always wondered and I think others do as well is you know how do you power through those days and those bad run, those days that you don't want to be out training and obviously you have to be out there for a long run and, and it's not just an hour and ninety minutes it's three hours or so um, and you know not only those days but then uh, those bad runs that you're just kind of like man not feeling it today and, and you got a long way to go you know how do you deal with those you know as an as an ultra trail runner when it's usually significantly longer than it would be for a normal type of race um i mean I, I view it as a challenge it's always good to make yourself more mentally tough and if i'm struggling in training i'll i'll think about it like i would in a race and i'll be like well the race is going to be a challenge too it's going to be tough there's going to be some spots where you don't feel good um and that's you know, you just have to try to work through it and uh, stay motivated by focusing on little goals, uh, like little races building up to a big race, or thinking about how tough the competition is going to be and how much tougher this makes me because I overcame this training run or this obstacle. Um, but you know, I mean, everyone's out there working hard and uh, training as hard as they can, so you got to be competitive and uh, push yourself out of your comfort zone quite a bit. Yeah, that makes uh, sense. Um, so <laughs> let's talk about some of your, your training and, and workouts. Uh, you know, what do you consider to be some of your key workouts um, that that you enjoy doing and that you also feel like when you're when you're done with them you're set you know, you can say to yourself, you know, that I'm I'm fit, you know, that was that was a good day. Uh, mainly for ultras it's the long run. Um, and I'll do usually a twenty eight miler uh, is my go to distance and if I run that at a, at a really good clip, I know I'm in shape, uh, depending on the course. Um, but also just doing my efforts up Green Mountain or doing, I did a lot of treadmill workouts actually okay. for Mount Washington. And I'll do like the Runner's World Uphill Challenge, actually it's Trail Runners Uphill Challenge, which is uh, 15 minutes at 15% incline on a treadmill. Wow. And you try to go as far as you can in distance. So you kind of set the pace. You could adjust the pace as you go, but it's a 15% incline. That's like straight up. <laughs> treadmill. And it's like a good like VO2 max test. And I remember I did that before Mount Washington, and I, I did 1.99 miles, um, which I, I felt really confident after that. Uh, so that's a good barometer of my fitness, too. So I'll run on the treadmill sometimes. Yeah, I was curious about that, actually, because um, somebody asked that question. They asked, you know, what treadmill workouts did you do in preparation for Mount Washington? And I actually responded, I don't think uh, Sage runs on the treadmill. Um, uh, yeah. But uh, but obviously you do, and, and so that was kind of one of your key workouts before that race. It was, yeah, definitely. I did that three weeks before, yeah. Cool. Um, so, you know, let's let's say that somebody is is you know one of their goals maybe for the new year upcoming is to to maybe do a trail race coming off, um, you know, traditionally training for a marathon, half marathon, that kind of thing. You know, how how do you think that they should uh, transition? You know, what what kind of things that they should do to get get prepared for that? Um, it depends if they're going like a fifty k. You mean fifty k? Yeah, I would say fifty k because I would I would imagine that's a pretty good introduction into into ultra slash trail running because going 100 mile your first time is probably not the smartest decision. <laughs> yeah, I know some people that have done it. but I'm uh, sure yeah. there are. <laughs> 50K is good. You know, 31 miles, uh, it still takes a lot longer than a road marathon depending on the course. Um, but, you know, the main thing I'd, I'd suggest is train a lot kind of like a marathon but with less emphasis on any track workouts, VO2 max workouts, and more emphasis on the long run. Um, and more emphasis on trying to get out on the trails. Uh, if you have some trails, you definitely want to get used to running on the trails more, get some hills in there too, uh, do some more hill workouts. Um, but it, it does depend on the, the course, but I think hills will make you stronger just to cover the extra distance. Mm -hmm. So I'd incorporate more hilly long runs, uh, maybe at uphill tempo runs is the workouts that I like to do, like the treadmill workout I mentioned basically. Yep. Um, and then just, you know, not worrying about crushing every easy pace run, not worrying about pace as much, uh, just kind of having that mindset that you want to spend time on your feet, um, and then kind of dial in your nutrition plan too. Mm -hmm. That would be the big difference is maybe get some trail shoes <laughs> <laughs> for that. Uh -huh. Um, 
you know, one of the things that, uh, that I've done with athletes that I coach who, who want to do, you know, specifically the 50K distances, one of the things that we'll do is kind of do back-to-back -back long runs. Um, and not necessarily full long runs, you know, not 220 milers, but, you know, do something where they do maybe 14 on a Saturday and, and maybe 18 or 20 on a, on a Sunday. Um, have you ever done something like that, and have you found it to be effective? Uh, I have, actually, yeah. I, I, uh, usually I'm too tired after, like, a 28-miler to go out and do a 20 the next day. Right, but well, 28 is pretty far. Yeah, I'll still try to put in, you know, a good 15-miler maybe the next day. And I'm, I'm actually really agree with that school of thought where, you, you know, especially for people that work 9 to 5, Monday through Friday, you might as well, you want to hit it really hard on the weekend. So you get in a big weekend, like maybe you put in 30 miles on a weekend uh, over two days. So I'm definitely in having your, you know, two hard days be really hard and then having some easy days really easy. So you get more of a, there's more of an extreme change between your really high mileage days and then your really easy days because maybe, you know, I'll do a 30 miler one day, but then I'll, uh, two days later, I'll just do like a five miler to totally recover from that. So right. it's definitely a bigger swing and how your long runs are really long and then you're relaxed and try to recover between them. Right. No, that makes a lot of sense. And, and, and from what it sounds like, that's actually probably the biggest difference between like probably optimal marathon training in the sense that, you know, the consistency is more important than any one or two big workouts. Whereas it sounds like, I mean, consistency is certainly important, but you know, it's it's a little bit easier to just say, you know, I'm going to get these big weekends in and, and maybe one or two big workouts and and just kind of fill in the rest. Is, is that probably a fair assessment? Oh, uh, yeah, definitely. Um, the, intent, the overall moderate intensity doesn't need to be there as much as it does in road marathoning. Um, but, I mean, generally, the, the higher the mileage you could average out, the better right. you would be doing in the ultra, too. Right, of um, course. But, you know, honestly, is, you're running a lot. <laughs> yeah, that is a difference, though, for sure. Yeah. Um, so, you know, let's talk a little bit about kind of the, the, you know, kind of how you go about things, you know, talk about, you know, uh, some of the sponsors and the, um, how you're going about, uh, you know, training for these races. Oh yeah. I've actually been really fortunate recently. I got on board with Scott sports. It's my major gear sponsor, shoe sponsor, and they've really helped me out a lot. They make a lot of shoes actually for trail runs, uh, mountain running, uh, cause they're European based. But also for like triathletes and road marathons too. So mm -hmm. uh, everyone should check them out. And then we'll throw up a link on this uh, at the end of this podcast, or we'll throw up a link uh, again, runnersconnect.net slash rc12. Check that oh, out, yeah. and you'll see the links for for everything Sage is talking oh, about here. That'd be great. And then uh, a local company, Ultimate Direction, uh, based out of Boulder, they're my hydration gear sponsor. So they give me a lot of my handheld 20 ounce uh, fluid bottles, and then they also have backpacks, uh, hydration vests that you could wear on these longer races that uh, you fill up with gels. Uh, there's a gel pouch I have from them. Really great, innovative products, and that always helps because you want to carry gels with you for sure on the run. Um, and then my nutrition sponsor, Flora Health Udo's Oil, which is actually Udo's Oil uh, gives you all these omega-3s, uh, so it's a lot of fatty acids mm -hmm. that you know I mix in with my salad dressing and I know Max King's another sponsored athlete with them. He says it really helps with his fat burning capacities. Okay. Uh, so it's it's important to take in your fats, eat some fats, eat some omega threes um, when you're training too. Yeah. And then uh, Smith Optics uh, for my sunglasses because it's really sunny out here in Boulder. Yeah. Uh, so. What is it? Something 300 sunny days a year or something to that effect? Yeah. Yeah, it's sunny every day, which is great. Coming from Oregon, it was like raining every day. Right, so. it's, it's a complete opposite, 300 I, days of rain. <laughs> this is sun for uh, my vitamin D synthesis. Yeah, nice. Um, actually, bef you know, before we go, let, let's talk a little bit about your tr nutrition in training, like on a daily basis, you know, kind of how does that how does that look? I mean, you know, I would, I mean, I remember when I was training for the marathon, I was eating like a fiend. I mean, I remember when I was living in the Bloomer House in, at Hanson's, uh, I remember waking up from a nap. And uh, I had lunch, and I, you know, slept maybe from like one to two or one to three, and I got up and I had a an entire box of cocoa puffs because I was like starving and I just needed chocolate, and I just ate a whole box of cocoa puffs, and then I had dinner like an hour later. But um, so, t you know, what's what's a you know kind of a your nutrition look like in training? Uh, I do eat a lot of carbs. I'm very carb based. I eat a lot of pasta, a lot of pizza, um, but I, I cook for myself a lot. Um, I, I'll make homemade pizza, actually, I just did the other night, 
And pasta is always easy to make, especially if you're tired late. Right. Um, and I'm actually, I've been a vegetarian my whole life. Okay. So that's probably a little bit unusual uh, for an endurance athlete. I know some other ultra runners that are too. Um, so I do have to take, I do take iron supplements and I, I get my blood checked uh, to make sure I get enough iron, mm -hmm. uh, B12. I'll take B12 supplements, vitamin D. The sun helps with that, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and I also try to, after I do a long run, I'll, I'll try to eat as soon as possible too because, you know, they say there's that 15-minute window where you want to take in quite a bit of carbs, a little bit of protein. Right. Um, and I'll start taking in more protein after a long effort because I know my muscles need to rebuild. Uh, so I'll eat a lot of omelets, eggs, um, try to eat a lot of salads and fruits too Just try to eat pretty healthy overall, not a whole bowl of Cocoa Puffs. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll indulge in uh, some beer maybe, or ice cream uh, every now and then. So it's always good to mix it up, and you get to eat quite a bit more because uh, you do burn those calories, so it's nice. Yeah. You know, it, it's interesting that you said you eat a lot of carbs because, um, you know, one of the things that I, I guess maybe there's a, you know, conception that I have of, of ultra runners and trail runners that they're all on, like, the paleo diet and, you know, just eating protein and, and natural. Um, you know, how do you feel? Do you feel like you ever kind of are – persuaded to go that direction just because of the community that you're a part of with the trail running? Uh, they're not going to persuade me. I'd have to persuade myself. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, no, I, I do know a lot of people. Uh, a lot of people are, you know, gluten intolerant too, so they, they do have to stay away from so many carbs. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't want to always carbo load before every long run because I think there's something to be said about kind of going into a long run empty. And right, absolutely. Kind of burning more fat uh, as you progress along, but... Um, no, I, I really like the taste of pizza and pasta. <laughs> uh, it's going to be hard to give that up, but, uh, I think, you know, just moderation and variety is the key. So, yeah. Um, so, you know, before we let you go, I, I know you do, uh, two things on your own as well. You have a company VO2 max productions. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Uh, yeah, basically VO2 max productions is my media outlet. Uh, I, I do coaching services off of it. I, it's a platform to sell my book, Running for the Hansons, uh, so I used it as a publisher to distribute that. Mm -hmm. And then we also have a YouTube channel, uh, VO2 Max Productions YouTube channel, uh, which I post a lot of videos uh, from races to training advice, uh, my mountain explorations. <laughs> uh, and uh, it's, it all helps me because I, I do get some income off of the ads on there and through selling my book and uh, coaching. So. Cool. Yeah, so right. we'll we'll throw up a link at the end of this pro, uh, at the end of this podcast again, or sorry, at the on the page for this podcast um, to check it out because I think you know if, if you're looking into doing some ultra running, I think Sage is probably a great person to to get some coaching from. Um, you know, and even if you're not, if you're just looking to, for some coaching, Sage is you know he knows what he's talking about. Um, and also, if, you know, if you're really into trail running and ultra running, you can check out uh, you know the videos that he posts and he does some shoe reviews and gear reviews and, and things like that. So definitely something to check out there. Um, but, uh, Sage, I want to thank you for taking the time out of your day, uh, to give us such an in-depth interview and share your training and your, you know, everything that you've learned with us. Um, we really appreciate it. Oh, thank you so much for having me on the show. It's an honor. Awesome. Well, good luck with all your races. All right. Thanks. Yep.